All right. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call to order our November left plan two board meeting. And uh, as customary, we'll take a moment of silence. And, and today, and just a kind of acknowledgement of what's happened on our freeway, it sounds like our our chair, our co-chair Jason was second or third on into a, sounds like a multi-fatality accident on uh, interstate heading northbound on I-5. And uh, so in, in addition to our thoughts and prayers to our brothers and sisters, uh, let's also think about those who are also suffered loss today. So let's be thankful. thankful. Take a moment. All right, thank you. Well, good morning. Looks like we have a uh, fairly, it's a good schedule outlined for the day. We should be able to get all our work done. Uh, for first order of business, we do have the approval of our September 26th and October. Wow. <laughs> right to business. Yeah, well, I like the senator attitude. <laughs> Got a new wow. feisty. Yeah. All right, uh, we do have a motion that's been made and seconded to adopt our September and October minutes. Is there discussion? Seeing none, all. Tor? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Uh, item number two, Mr. Nelson. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, the Left Plan 2 Retirement Board is required under its enabling statutes to undergo an annual financial audit. Most state agencies get audited periodically by the uh, office of the, by the state auditor. Um, this year, uh, in the past, you've had presentations on that annual financial audit from different accountants who've been hired by the board. This year, the board entered into a contract with the state auditor's office to provide that annual financial audit. And so uh, today to present the results of that are the team from the state auditor's office. If you want to come up and introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Troy Niemeyer with the state auditor's office. I'm the assistant director of the state audit division. And I'll actually, uh, as part of our presentation, I will uh, introduce the team here in just a moment. Uh, but wanted to start off saying um, thank you for having us, and it's, it's good to see such a good turnout for your board meeting. Um, it's pretty apparent to us that, that this board is con is, uh, puts a, a good value on, on audits and transparency, and we really appreciate that from the auditor's office. Uh, we enjoyed uh, performing this engagement for you um, and look forward to a continued relationship with the board. Um, so part of our, our mission, the mission of our office is to provide citizens with independent and transparent examinations of how state and local governments uh, use public funds. And an audit like this where we're auditing your schedule of expenditures um, is a perfect fit for what we do and, and what we're all about. Um, I want to tell you just a little bit about our office in case anyone's not aware. We're established in the state constitution uh, as the auditor of all public accounts. Uh, we don't audit to any uh, private business or industry, just government specifically. Uh, we audit every state and local government in Washington. Uh, we have teams around the state to help us perform that work. Uh, about 440 people right now in total, uh, for, and most of which are auditors. Um, so that's with state and local government agencies, we audit over 3,000 um, entities throughout Washington um, and issue more than 2,000 reports every single year. Um, and uh, again, since we don't audit private, private firms, uh, we don't compete with CPA firms, but in essence, uh, with the body of work we do, we're the largest CPA firm in the state of Washington. So, and we specialize in government, so. Okay, so for some introductions, uh, to my right we have Mike Hutchison uh, here. Um, he's been with the office since 1996, so he's got a ton of experience. He's worked on both the state government side of our office and the local uh, government side. Um, he was the auditor in charge of this engagement and uh, basically did the bulk of the work. Um, uh, to my right in the middle is uh, Jim Brownell. He's the audit manager of the, the team that did this audit. Um, he's been with the office since 2005. Um, manages um, audits like this as well as uh, the statewide single audit, which is uh, the audit of federal funds for the entire state of Washington. 
Uh, it's the largest uh, audit engagement our office does, and uh, he has a great team that, that does that. Uh, they also do um, uh, accountability audits of um, state agencies. Um, again, my name is Troy. I'm the um, Assistant Director of State Audit, and so um, Sadie and I, who you can see on your screen, and Sadie's right behind us here, um, we team up to kind of oversee all of the state uh, audit teams. Um, and so that it covers every financial statement audit of, of state government, um, including higher education, um, the statewide single audit, as I mentioned, that Jim's team does, as well as fraud and whistleblower investigations uh, for state agencies. Um, Sadie has been, well, I guess I'll start with myself. I've been with the office since 2006. Um, also worked on the state um, and local audit divisions. So uh, quite a broad array of experience uh, doing all kinds of audits, audits like this, um, other financial statement audits, as well as the, the federal single audits and accountability audits and investigations. Um, Sadie has been with us forever, um, since 1998. <laughs> Seems like forever in auditor years. Um, and she has also worked on the state and local side. Um, tons of experience as a manager and also as, as an assistant director before becoming our director. And uh, she's a certified fraud examiner and um, we're really pleased to have her with us today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jim. Thank you, Troy. So we want to start with um, what our scope was for this particular audit. And the scope was of uh, auditing your schedule of expenditures that covered state fiscal year 2018. So that would have been uh, July 1st, 2017 through June 30th of 2018. And during that time period, the board spent about $1.2 million. So in summary, um, most important I think for all you to know is we're issuing you a clean opinion. Uh, unmodified as it's known in the audit world. And what that means is the statement that we audited was presented fairly in all material respects, uh, the budget and actual amounts for uh, the board for that time period. So we're gonna go into a little bit more detail about what we did, what those results are, and then at the end of the presentation, I'll talk to you about the report that uh, we'll be publishing um, that uh, encapsulates all our work. So Mike. I'd like to share some audit highlights uh, I, I experienced during the audit. You know, the we entrance with the agency, uh, I would say the second, uh, the second week of the September, and uh, I was able to uh, wrap up the, all my testing the uh, third week of October. And I, I, I do understand that, that this is a small audit, but this is really rare. In the, all the testing only take a little more than a month, and uh, this is really rare. The reason was, uh, throughout the audit, uh, I received a really good cooperation from agency staff. All the executive director and uh, administrative managers, they, uh, they, they provide us all the information I requested in a very timely manner, and all the information I received from them was, was uh, really accurate and complete. So I don't have to ask uh, the same information more than once. That was really good, uh, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, during, uh, during the audit processes, uh, there was always uh, some of the ex uh, small exceptions we identified, and we have to make adjustment to the draft, uh, fi uh, draft financial statement. And uh, by the way, the, all those adjustments we made to the draft audit financial statement is uh, really minor in nature. And I worked together with uh, the agency, and uh, in some cases, I, uh, I uh, I accepted the agency's recommendations because that makes sound, it makes sense and reasonable. And in some cases, agency accepts our recommendation. In the end, there was no uncorrected misstatement in the audited financial statement. That was a really good experience. And uh, the lastly, uh, the, during my the audit of the financial statement, and there was no material misstatement in the financial statement. That, that need to be corrected by the management. And uh, for the financial statement audit, this is really big deal. And uh, that was really good. And then now let's talk about the, what I did. And uh, what happened when I do the financial statement audit? You know, the, we have a set of rules and policies that set up by the, the based upon the, all the auditing standard. And I follow those standard and standard required we have to do the analysis of financial information and we have to evaluate and identify the key systems and the procedures that matters to the board, uh, 
matters to the agencies. And during my evaluation, and we identified the salaries and wages and benefit and the general disbursement being the key systems and procedures. So we identified those two procedures. And now that since this is the financial statement audit, we have to evaluate the, the procedures the, the agency has, uh, has over the financial st uh, statement preparation processes. And we take a look, you know, we sit down with both you know, the agency staff and the, the step, the OFM step hired by the agency, and we, uh, we get a basic understanding of the, those systems and their procedures and evalu uh, evaluate the risk associated, associated with those procedures. And then we select the, the transactions related to those two, three, uh, two systems and procedures, and we test the transactions. And lastly, the, the, the basically financial statement consists of two parts the financial statement itself and note to the financial statement. And uh, we also need to examine the note to the financial statement to ensure they are fairly presented. And now, the, the, you might ask, uh, so Michael, what, what did you do? Well, <laughs> you know, there were so many aspects of transaction, like even the salary. And there was uh, like, uh, uh, do we have to uh, uh, take a look at the the approval of the, all the, the, the executive manager's salaries, or what do we do? You know, the, the SA, well, we use the risk-based approaches, and meaning the, we evaluate the systems and procedures and they ask ourselves, uh, what's the risk? If something goes wrong, what's the risk that will cause the financial statement being misstated? And we take a look at the, the pay, uh, wages and salary related systems and uh, systems and procedures. And we are very comfortable with the way the board authorized the executive manager salaries and the way the executive manager they authorized the, the step salaries. So, and the, the, the risk we identify was like if the, there was some risk that will cause the financial statement misstated will be, right? The, well, the payroll expense has been incurred, but you know, if the, the those expense, uh, expenditures are not recorded in the financial statement, the financial statement will be misstated. So based upon the risk we identified, that risk we identified, we developed the, uh, the testing strategies and uh, select the, the five months out of 12 months and take a look at those transactions to make sure those expenditures were recorded in the financial <coughs> statement. During our testing, we didn't find any exceptions, so that looks pretty good. And for the disbursement, we do the exactly same thing. What's the risk? Uh, if there is a some, something is not uh, going right, that will cause the financial statement, uh, uh, statement misstated. And uh, for the disbursement, we identify the classification. As you, ca as you know that the, the financial expenditure, schedule of expenditures of the board will, category, uh, will break down each category of the disbursement. So for the disbursement, if the agency incurred the, some of the expenditures related to the employee development and mistakenly coded that as a facility related services, as that's not going to be good because, you know, the, the ex facility related expenditure will be overstated and the employee development e e expenditure related to the e employee development will be understated. I do understand the board want to see the exactly, the, I mean, the, the board approved all the budget for the each line item. So our risk was, our risk was, okay, if that is the board intention, we want to make sure all the expenditure the agency incurred was recorded they are yeah, correctly recorded. So board, yeah, board understand that, the, okay, here's the, the expenditure we approve and here's the, here's the budget that yeah, yeah, we approved for each line item and here's the actual expenditure the agency incurred. And so that was our risk and we developed again the testing strategy to address those risks and uh, we perform a testing. And during the, uh, the, during the testing, we did not identify any exceptions. And again, the, this is kind of rare, not be able to identify any exceptions at all, so, but let us look. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, so the next slide uh, talks about the presentation disclosures. So Mike mentioned that we examined your notes, um, and again, we didn't find any concerns that needed to be reported um, in our audit or to you as the board. So we did have one audit recommendation, and we call these exit recommendations. And the reason is 
that this is not referenced nor included in our audit report, which means to us it's insignificant but important enough to bring to management's attention. Um, as Mike mentioned, the board contracts or pays for a service actually with the state's Department of Enterprise Services, and they provide accounting services, payroll, administrative type functions. Um, but ultimately, the board is responsible for the statement and how it's put together and the inputs into it. So our recommendation is fairly simple. We just recommend that the board have a little bit more involvement in the coding of how things are put in uh, to AFERS uh, in terms of how it's coded. So we had some discussions at the exit conference with management. Um, it seems like everyone's on the same page. Again, it's a very uh, minor recommendation. We did not find any problems, and we want to emphasize that with uh, what we examined. Um, it's just a little bit more oversight we recommend. So does anyone, anyone have any questions about the exit recommendation? What would that look like? Sorry. Sure. Can you explain that walkthrough? Yeah, so what we're recommending is the board have a little bit more involvement up front with how things are coded because in AFERS, which is the state's financial system, um, it's BES owns that system, but if the board doesn't like how certain things are, like the buckets, the expenditures are put in, you have the discretion to put things where you think they belong. It's just more conversation and more, um, more oversight that we're recommending the board have. For instance, for us, we would um, make a hypothetical like a, a, the contract to, with the state auditor's office to perform the annual financial um, audit. We would provide where, which bucket we think it's going to go into to DES and look to make sure that it went into the correct bucket afterwards instead of just relying on to identify the correct bucket and put it in there themselves. And um, there's processes for correcting it if something gets put in the wrong bucket, but, uh, and DES, as you heard, they did a great job in the past year correctly categorizing everything, but this would avoid potentially any miscategorization and need for correction in the future. So moving on, uh, the most important thing probably to you is our report, and this was provided to you in your materials. There's a few things in the report I want to highlight, and uh, forgive me for not having it up on the screen, um, but a few things of note. There's two parts of our report, um, and actually there's two reports within it. Number one is our independent auditor's report on the board's internal controls over financial reporting and compliance. The second is our opinion on your statement, and they fit together. Um, a few parts uh, to highlight. We state in our report that we are not auditing a full-blown set of financial statements. We're limiting our uh, examination solely to your statement of um, expenditures or your schedule, forgive me. Um, and that's important to note because typically when folks see financial statements, they're expecting you know, assets, liabilities, revenues, expenditures, so we make it clear we're only auditing and opining on your expenses. Um, and secondly, we emphasize that we did not find any deficiencies in your internal controls, um, nor any instances of material noncompliance. That's in the first report. And the next report contains our opinion on your statement, which is a clean opinion. So those are some important highlights for you. Um, did anyone have any questions about the report? Okay. I, I, just yes, kind sir. of a crazy one. You mentioned five months is what kind of your snapshot you looked at. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that was a sample. Uh, we don't examine all transactions. Right. So for payroll, we right. looked at five months. Yes. Five months. Is that consecutive or is it just five random months that you pick? Or I just oh, actually, the, the, again, the, the, when we examined the payroll, the, our risk was whether the, all the payroll expenditures we incurred all the payroll expenditure incurred was recorded in a financial statement. But which we actually take a look at the, all those expenditure they incurred in, uh, in those uh, five months and trace back to the financial statement. Which so months we did we examine? Uh, was it consecutive or? Oh, yeah, consecutive. It was oh, no, no, it's, it's a random. It's a random. Random? Okay. Yeah, it's a random. All right. So your report will be published on our website, and our plan is to publish it next Monday. 
um, unless you have any questions or concerns that uh, you want to bring to our attention. We shared it with management, and it sounds like they're comfortable with, uh, with the layout. And um, again, we're pleased to report no problems, uh, no misstatements that need to be corrected. Um, another important thing to let you know about is the cost. Um, the cost of this audit was $4,450, and how that uh, was calculated, it was a 50-hour engagement um, for the entire audit, and at that time, or right now, we charge $89 per hour. Um, should the board choose to contract us with us in the future, um, we're only expecting the audit to take 40 hours, um, and our billing rate's going up a little bit this coming year, so we expect it to cost $3,800 if you choose to contract us. Yes, sir. I'm going up <laughs> That's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. Our spell check. Uh, yeah. Didn't hear what you said. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> just, just I'll do no. Down. But it's a good question as far as our billing rate. Um, we did have a salary increase for all of our audit staff, so that's reflected there. But correct. Thank you okay. for pointing that out. Um, <laughs> And again, this is completely optional. There's no mandate that you contract with us. Obviously, you've used uh, CPA firms in the past, but we'd love the opportunity to work with you. It's, uh, I think it's a good partnership. So with that, I want to open it up for anyone if you have questions for us. So you mentioned you, you posted on your website. Do we, Steve, do we post it as well? Yes, all the, all the materials that are presented to the board, including this report, are presented on the board's website. I mean, will the will the audit stand alone somewhere? Just curious. I mean, I've got the got the report in front of me here too under the minutes. I'm just kind of curious if they've done that in the past or how that's been acknowledged. I think in the past we've just done it as part of the meeting materials, okay. but I can we could uh, set it apart separately if you'd like. I don't know. I think I think it's something to be proud of. I appreciate your work. I think we we do have good work here. We've done by our our staff and our board. I think it's something to be proud of. Usually we'll have like a, a, a uh, something on the front page mentioning okay. that. Okay. I would like to take a moment both, one, to thank uh, Mike for your um, professionalism throughout the engagement, especially the time that you were in the office and working with my team. And uh, Troy, uh, yes, look forward to continuing this relationship in the future. It was a, uh, I think it was a, a very positive um, experience and g the board got great product out of it as well. So thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Nice work. Thank you for the time. Yep. All right. Mr. Nelson, uh, item number three, funding policy. All right. This one, I'm going to I'm going to get down and move to the presentation table, um, and I'll be doing so. Bear with me, especially on the technology piece of this. I'll be doing it with Lisa, and um, and she's got the hook. If I run off of uh, off of script or whatever, but anyway, let me let me move up there and get going. I want to make sure you did hear that correct, right? You have the hook. I asked for a hook, yeah. <laughs> and I found one in their office, but it doesn't look like anyone brought it. All right. And just to clarify, um, Lisa Wan, State Actuary's Office, and I'm here just to answer any questions you have during Steve's presentation that are of an actuarial nature. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. This presentation was in, in intended to be a follow-up to the board's action that you took at your June meeting and the discussions that you had at your September meeting. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background for those of you who may have joined the board since June or who may not have been there at the October meeting so that we're kind of all on the same page. Um, part of the responsibilities of the Left Plan 2 board is to adopt the contribution rates for the plan. You also are responsible for adopting the actuarial cost method and all of the funding policies that go into calculating that contribution rate. 
Uh, the board has adopted a strategic plan and part uh, one of the four goals of that plan is to maintain the financial integrity of the plan. Over the years, you have refined that what that means and two of the key goals that came out of that is to make sure the plan's fully funded and members don't have to worry about uh, whether or not their benefits are going to get paid in the future when they retire. And then also to maintain stable contribution rates based on the expected long-term cost of the plan. Uh, Mark was here when the board was first formed and at the time the board was formed, all of the pension plans in the state of Washington had contribution rates at all-time historic lows. Um, the actuarial, some of the actuarial assumptions had been reset by the legislature that drove down liabilities in the plans dramatically and drove down contribution rates dramatically. When the board was first created, that was one of the first goals of the board is understanding what should be, what is the cost of the plan? If it changes every year, you know, what, what should it, what is the cost? And so that expected long-term cost of the plan is what came out of those early discussions. This slide is uh, incorrect. And I apologize for that because I was the one who wrote it. At your m June meeting, there was a motion to adopt the entry age normal cost, but that motion got clarified. What you adopted in June was the aggregate funding method with a 100% floor. Now, the what, how that differs from what. Uh, um, what the entry age normal cost method, it, that gets to be a little bit confusing. This was meant to be a follow-up, so rather than trying to go back and readdress all of the confusion that I created um, resulting from the June meeting, I'm, I'm only going to uh, talk about those as necessary. If the confusion from that starts to spill over, particularly into anything that I say today, um, the, any actuarial cost method kind of has two components. There's the base cost, and I'm talking in non-actuarial language here. So this is where I always uh, run the risk of creating confusion. But there's the base cost of the plan, and then there's uh, a method for dealing with the unfunded liability of the plan. Um, you have used from the beginning of the board, so going back now 15 years, you've used <coughs> the normal cost component of the entry age normal cost as sort of your base cost component. And in June, that the idea was instead of making that a temporary policy versus a long-term policy, um, that, that you would adopt that as your long-term policy. And I'm not 100% sure if that's what happened or not, but we'll get that straightened out. The plan today, though, was the follow-up now on what do you do to manage the unfunded liability or the funded ratio. Left plan two, you, it's kind of like you're, you, you're experiencing some really good news but that's created a management challenge. So you've had the longest sustained run up in market history. And as a result, the last actuarial valuation identified that the current funded ratio for left plan two is 109%. That's good news. But it's also then something to manage for a couple of different reasons. We talked about this in October. One, it could create the perception that the plan is overfunded and run the risk of uh, the legislature coming in and saying, uh, you're, you're doing a great job, we're gonna fix that. And, um, and adjusting either the 
uh, adjusting the rates adopted by the board. And it's clear to say, as far as rate setting goes, there's no real um, urgency to the discussions that we're having. The rates have already been adopted by the board for the 1921 biennium and the 2123 biennium. So this is just kind of managing um, one, both the political risk, the other risk that was talked about is if you're paying more now than you need to be for the benefits, then you are potentially transferring a cost from uh, your, this generation, if you will, of workers is paying more than they should and uh, the future generation of workers might end up <coughs> paying less than they should. So there's what's referred to as an intergenerational equity issue that's raised. Now, board's goal in June, goals in June, I want to make sure this part is clear uh, without hopefully creating more confusion. You had two goals in terms of adopting a new long-term funding method. One, when, as long as you had a long-term method and a short-term method, the VAL report um, had to reflect the long-term method and so the rates in the actuarial valuation report were calculated using the uh, aggregate funding method with a 90% floor, even though that method wasn't used to fund the plan. It wasn't used by the board for adopting rates. So there was a bit of a disconnect. You had two different rates out there. This, and occasionally that would create confusion. Um, and a second area where it came up is then during fiscal notes. Fiscal notes were calculated by the actuary using the long-term method, but that wasn't the necessarily the, you know, that wasn't the method that was being used by the board in setting the supplemental rates. So there'd be a bit of a disconnect there as well. So the two goals in June were adopting a long-term policy that would resolve that disconnect and eliminate the need to produce two sets of rates or to use one set of calculations for fiscal notes and a different set of calculations for rates. Um, we'll be working with OSA prior to the December meeting and prior to next interim to make sure that uh, our understanding of what the board did in June did resolve both of those concerns. And if not, we'll consult with OSA and bring back ideas uh, for what you can do to address those two concerns, the uh, inconsistency between the LABA rates and the board's rate setting policy and the inconsistency between fiscal note, fiscal note rate calculations and the board's rate setting policy. Now, the follow-up to that, though, is what do you do to manage the good news that you've had? 109% funded ratio, positive uh, funded ratio, a positive unfunded liability, kind of sounds like a double negative, but in actuarial terms, a negative unfunded liability. Um, Historically, there are two ways for lowering um, the funded ratio. Or one is by reducing contributions. So the funded ratio decreases when the amount of money going into the plan in the future is decreased. And this, ha under the entry age normal cost method, historically that's done by creating a separate rate, a UAAL rate, which amortizes that unfunded liability over the working life of the members. For left two, that's roughly about 15 years. The pros and cons of that approach is that it keeps the funded ratio closer to 100%. It's designed, whether you're above or below, to balance it back to 100%. The um, downside is it 
contrary to the goal of rate stability because you're constantly making these small these adjustments either up or down to get bring you closer to 100. What the board has done, especially since 2008, is focused on the rate stability component. At the time the board adopted your short-term policy in 2008, the idea at that time was that is a very constant cost. It changes when long-term assumptions change or when demographic assumptions change or when benefits change, but otherwise it's isolated from like the fluctuations in the market. So uh, the volatility in the investments wasn't going to carry through to your rates. And it also eliminated what had been a concern for the board early on that not only are the rates affected by the markets, but they seem to be counter uh, intuitive. So when the markets are going terrible and the state budgets in going down, that's when contributions increase. And conversely, when things are going great, the markets are going great, the economy's going great, and the state budget has got uh, more money than usual, the rates go down. So that uh, policy that was adopted by the board in 2008 eliminated that dynamic as well from rate volatility. And then as the 10 years since then played out, that policy has uh, served the board and the budget writers and the families who also pay 50% of the costs and have a budget impact for the rates that you adopt very well. You are able to predict with um, very accurate, um, you're able to forecast future rates very accurately. So for planning purposes, that stability has been a benefit both to the, uh, to all the people who make contributions to the plan. That would get eroded a little bit if you went to entry age normal with a 15 year amortization. But it, that is a very common type of, of um, plan out there. The 15 year amortization may not be as common. Some plans are struggling to pay their liabilities and so they've amortized those unfunded li negative unfunded liabilities over a longer period of time to help uh, reduce their contributions. But that is one way of managing a positive funded ratio. Another thing that can reduce the funded ratio of a plan is benefit improvements. Um, so for instance, last session there was a bill dealing with uh, LNI presumptions for PTSD had a small cost impact on left two to the extent that there would be more duty related uh, disabilities granted and uh, more duty related deaths approved. There may be small uh, liability increases from benefit improvements that are being considered for the upcoming legislature. Uh, one of those you'll hear about later on uh, th today has to do with the month of death uh, benefit improvement that's being, uh, that's before the board and was before the Select Committee on Pension Policy. Another one that's been talked about is a follow-up to another LNI presumption bill that was out there last session and uh, made it almost all the way but did not quite <coughs> that that may come back and that could have a small rate impact as well. Um, but the third thing that particularly we wanted to talk about today is a different way of approaching managing that positive funded ratio and that is taking some of the actuarial risk in the plan off the table by using more conservative actuarial factors. That lowers the funded ratio and it also reduces the likelihood that you could have adverse actuarial experience in the future. So right now, the and, and correct me if I definitely say this one wrong, the, but the, the 
assumptions are based on the actuary's best estimate in a terms of a pure uh, statistical likelihood that's usually then tr you're looking for a medium around 50 percent 50 percent likely to be better than what's expected 50 percent likely to be worse than expected um, generally yeah now you could if if you wanted to make it slightly better the odds slightly better than 50 50 you could um, adjust some of the actuarial factors to manage some of that risk Th those are the kind of things and that we'd have to work with OSA about identifying where those risks exist how factors could be changed um, to manage those risks what kind of changes would be reasonable because ultimately the actuary's office will have to sign off on any of these as being reasonable. Can, can I in, interrupt oh yes, please. for a moment? Please, I'm um, on a roll, just, so break it up. <laughs> just as your actuary, I just, uh, I'm and sitting up here, I um, just want to clarify that our office is not recommending that um, you're, that you should reduce any of your act actuarial risks. So my understanding is Steve is just presenting options to you um, if you're concerned that your funded status is too high. So our office is not recommending that you need to be reducing any of your actuarial risk. I just recognized this in Steve's presentation as one of the options in front of you. And if that's an option you're interested in, I'd be happy to share my thoughts on um, what that could look like. Yeah, and that wouldn't be any anything for today. That would be yeah. something we'd be working on over time, and there could be a number of different pieces to that. But yeah, this is cert all of these things, all three of these options up there are ways of managing a positive funded ratio. You're not being asked to take action on any of these today. You're not being asked to reduce contributions or change actuarial factors. This is just sort of setting the stage for the next set of questions that you're going to have to face as a board, which is, should you do something about the funded ratio? And if so, what are your options and what are you going to do about it? That was a, kind of the topic for the October strategic planning meeting. Yeah, we have a question. Go ahead. Oh. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a point in time, kind of an observation here with a question. You have a, uh, it's interesting, this topic's coming up right now. At the same time, we've had input from, from different groups out there talking about uh, the longest econ economic run-up in history at this point, although it's been fairly modest. Maybe that's part of the reason that it's, it's lasted so long. Uh, and that we're, we understand that market cycle and, and it, anticipating that we're probably not far off, a correction be a severe word, but a cycle at this point. It, it's, it's a, is it a point in time that you're bringing this, con this, this discussion up right now to try and address uh, maybe getting in front of that a little bit? Not, not, not to play with the funding rate, or, or say for example, the expected rate of return in particular, but, but to address what could be coming from a down cycle at this point and maybe get a little bit in front of it so that like last time around 2008, 2009, we were ahead of the market in our adjustments and we wrote it out, we stayed uh, you know, at 100% or better when everybody else around us fell apart and moved some into the yellow, some into the red zone. Would you consider having this discussion to be timely right now because of the, the uh, economic cycles? Are you asking Steve or your actuary? Wh whoever wants to answer. <laughs> well, from my perspective, yes, that's been, uh, Lisa and I talked about the funded method at last year's strategic planning meeting and the strategic planning meeting the year before. Um, back in 2008, when the board adopted that long-term, expected long-term cost as the rate, the idea was market cycle, as they go up and down, the funded ratio is going to go up and down, but in general, the funded ratio will probably stay close to 100, and your rate will stay very stable. The markets haven't cycled, and so the funded ratio hasn't gone up and down. It's just gradually increased, um, and 
that at least raised the question of should you do something about that and um, um, what are the options? And I've got a slide that kind of gets to that in just two slides. Um, the, just some examples of the types of ways you could reduce actuarial risk. These are not proposals, but you could, as you mentioned, the, a lower investment return assumption. Um, maybe you used a, use a different investment return assumption for the portion of your portfolio that's related to retirees, since they're not contributing anymore. Those would all, uh, you could, um, you have in the past adopted projected improvements in life expectancy, not as a way of reducing risk or taking risk off the table, but uh, because those were recommended as part of the base cost. But changing those types of assumptions to further <coughs> reduce the risk, right now the, the Society of Actuaries is working on a number of new types of risk measures for pension plans. <coughs> The funded ratio of 100% doesn't really tell you much. It's a snapshot in time about what you're expected to look like in the future. For plans who have a high payroll, risks may be different from younger plans or plans with a very low payroll, like say left one. Um, and what are, th how are those risks different and how can you manage those risks? That is a growing area of understanding in the actuarial profession right now. We are um, fortunate, I've been told, that by uh, act other actuaries and people at the conferences, that educational conferences, that OSA and Matt Smith in particular are at the forefront in understanding and the discussion of these new types of risks and associated risk measures. So the board is, if, you, if you're looking for consultants on as far as understanding this risk and managing this risk, we've probably already got the best consultants in the country, in the state, right, there, we've, there, they're already working for us. So that's good. Now, back to your earlier question, at the October meeting, they were discussing sort of concepts, what, you know, point in time, what do you do at different point in time, what should be done sort of at this point in time, if anything. And out of those discussions, I kind of took them all together and, and came up with um, this concept. So for instance, Using the funded ratio as a, as a measurement for determining when you should take action and what kind of action you could take, this was sort of an idea. If you had a funded ratio corridor of 95 to 100 percent, then you right in the middle of that, the 100 to 105 percent, um, Representative Burquist, I wanted to make sure he got credit for this. He called. He was like, that might be like the zone of comfort. You're in 100, 105%, you don't do anything. You're right where you uh, need to be and you're not concerned at all. Now, if you dip a little bit below that, 95 to 100, or you get a little bit above 105 to 110, then you might have some concerns. Not necessary that you take action, but you should at least analyze, so for instance, which direction are you headed? Are you at 95 and headed down? Or are you at 95 and headed up? That might make a big difference. Are you at 110 and headed back down? Or in the case of the board right now, you're at 109. What are the trends? Are, you, are the, is the funded ratio trending further up? Or is it now, uh, perhaps trending back towards 100. If you got over 110 or less than 95, then you would have action. You would take some kind of action to bring the funded ratio back within the zone of comfort or zone of concern, but either 
increasing the funded ratio by adding contributions or reducing liabilities or <coughs> maybe uh, decreasing it by decreasing contributions. Right now where you're at, you're at 109. So uh, using this as a thing, you would be monitoring trends and preparing a response. The trends we talked a little bit about at your October meeting, and the trends are all positive. So you have um, more deferred gains, for instance, on the books right now than you have deferred losses from the smoothing method. That will tend to push the funded ratio up in the future. You also have another good year of investment returns that hasn't been reflected yet in any valuation. The last fiscal year was above the assumed rate of 7.4, so you'll have even more deferred gains after that. Uh, the actuary's office did a, a good analysis for you of what just if those gains if you earn 7.4 for the next 10 years and those deferred gains passed in through, what would the funded ratio look like? And then they also, to kind of address your concern of what if we're about due for a correction, they did another sample of what would it look like if we had a repeat of the Great Recession, just to sort of give a worst case scenario, what would that do to the funded ratio? And so you had kind of those two extremes, if you will, or where you're projected versus sort of the worst case scenario to talk about in October. The, I don't remember the exact number, but based if, if you hit 7.4 for the next uh, 10 years and all of those deferred gains pass through the system, you're likely to go up from 109, if I remember correctly, to about 118. So you would definitely exceed 110. So according to this, what we would be doing then is preparing responses for you. That's kind of what we're talking about then is, so for instance, in um, if this is a policy that you want to use for identifying when, what you're gonna do in the future and communicating what you're planning on doing to legislators and other stakeholders, then what we'd be working on now is OSA and coming up with options for you, um, preparing that response, if you will, for next interim, bring you some things that you could consider that would manage that uh, positive funded ratio and uh, get the trend headed back to 100. Some of that, the markets may turn around if there's a correction in the near future. Some of that may be done for you, um, but at least at this point in time, bringing you options so that if, if, the, um, if it's not fixed by the markets, it'll be, you, you'll be able to manage it yourselves. So uh, this, I got a, these are some of the things that could have an effect on the um, investment or on the uh, funded ratio. So the past year was good. Maybe, maybe the next year won't be. Um, there is the potential for benefit improvements which, which could increase liabilities, which would decrease the funded ratio. Uh, OSA is in the process of finishing the next demographic experience study. I'll give you a preview of that in December, but I don't think I, I don't know, don't, not expecting that the preview will have any type of potential rate impacts analyzed yet. But depending on that demographic experience or any changes in demographic assumptions that are recommended coming out of that, you could have gains or losses. Um, at this point in time, don't know which would be. So you might even have more good news to manage. Um, speaking with my peers around the country, Managing good news, which is the challenge that the board is facing right now, is a much better place to be than managing the bad news that a lot of pension plans are facing. But it is still a management challenge that you have and that we'll be working with OSA to um, bring you back some options in 2019. Jeff, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a follow-up, you mentioned uh, smoothing. 
Uh, interesting. You've hit so many points. You know, you've, you've pre presented an integration of so many different aspects of what's happening here. Uh, it, it, it occurs to me, our smoothing corridor run seven years, nine years. It's uh, from zero to eight. Okay, so eight years. Well, I know. What, is there any chance, and I, I'm not going to ask the question correctly, is there any chance that there is some sort of a, a statistical illusion that's created by an economic run-up that, that lasts longer than the sine wave would uh, for our, our smoothing corridor of eight years there? So if the, if the run-up's 10 years, the smoothing's eight years, you know, are we extending something that, uh, just curiosity? Um, yes. Now, the, again, this is the longest run-up in history. So prior to this run-up, the idea of 10 sustained years of growth wasn't something that was mathematically considered. Usually the, the purpose of the smoothing method is just that, that you don't react to short-term changes. You let the market volatility play out and the gains offset some of the losses and you end up making smaller adjustments as a, res um, as a result. So the smoothing method is designed to help stabilize the contribution rates. But again, yeah, if um, the most common smoothing method out there is about five years. So it's usually even shorter than the boards. Um, one of the things that could, one of the changes for managing that could be a change in the smoothing method. Um, the, I will say the board smoothing method has kind of served you well, and so I don't know that you don't want to overreact to the Great Recession. You don't want to overreact to a historic market run-up either. I will say this, though, just mm -hmm. in quick kudos to you. Um, in the last 10 years, you've experienced both. The plan has experienced both the Great Recession uh, worst downturn since the recession and uh, uh, since the uh, market crash and the Great Depression and you've also experienced the longest sustained market run-up in history so you've kind of the plan has hit both extremes during that time your rates have remained remarkably stable you were the I've said it a number of times I'll say it again you were the only statewide plan in the country that came out of the Great Recession, fully funded, no contribution rate increases, no benefit decreases. The only plan. So your policies definitely served you well dealing with the Great Recession. Now you find yourself dealing with good news, uh, lots of good news, which is also, um, it's a good problem to have if you, if you will. If the markets had been cyclical as usual and, uh, you know, it had gone up for three and down for three or one and then up and you, we probably wouldn't be having this discussion today, Senator Holy, but um, because of the fact that that sustained push-up has got your funded ratio up to an area now where you've got, you've got concerns. Uh, um, how concerning? That's kind of up to you, but it is definitely now something that to bring to your attention for your discussion and uh, about how to manage it. Now, yeah. uh, with uh, Steve, yeah, Ade. yeah, I think uh, we had some of this conversation last time. I think uh, one of the things that make <coughs> left two from the employer and from the employee point of view, one of the best system actually in the country is the stability of the rate. So I think we need to be careful in just moving with the wave or whatever it is. If it's all possible, we also need to be careful in solving a temporary problem 
with a permanent long-term liability. As good as it is to increase benefit, the moment you increase the benefit, you've increased your ongoing cost. So I think if it's all possible, if we can have a range, say, well, okay, just your last slide where we say, if we exceed 110, if we fall below 95 consistently for a period of five years or whatever the number of years, then we need to take action. Just reacting on the moment issue, I think we need to be really careful. The economy can go on a boom for a period of time. It can also go on a downhill for a period of time. So we need to give ourselves some time considering that period of uh, growth or decline without reacting too quickly for any of these things. Uh, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, Ade. I'm going back to a point that I wanted to make earlier. The board's goals in June and the board's goals since 2008 have prioritized rate stability. And that has served all of the stakeholders of the plan very well. To the extent that there's any uh, changes to funding policies, that is maintaining that stability is one of the goals. And that's why by far the most common method out there would be lowering contribution rates or increasing benefits. Those have been, at least historically, those have been the, the two ways of uh, managing uh, funded ratios once they get above 100, both in this state and other states. We're trying to come up with other options. That's where we're talking about the actuarial um, risk as a different option so that you could maintain that uh, stability in rates without creating lo long-term, potentially long-term or permanent liabilities in the plan that might be management challenges for the future. Those are, those are great questions and those would be the kind of questions that would be dealt with in the future uh, as those different options come before you and you can debate the pros and cons. Um, most of the actuarial funded methods, the, the uh, aggregate method is used for all the other plans in the state. The entry age normal cost method is the most common one for public plans around the country. Neither of those methods provides the type of rate stability that your policies have provided for left to. Um, but they also don't have funded ratios getting up to 109 or higher uh, very commonly either. So sort of uh, pros and cons. With, with your beneficial stability has come now this management challenge of what do you do? How do you manage a 10-year sustained run-up now that one actually has happened? What could or should you do about it? Um, from the perspective of the plan members, their benefits are obviously 100% secure if the plan's funded ratio is above 100. And, but they may, they may feel like well, they're paying more contributions than they need to. From the, so th th that's the, the, the policy balances now that you'll have to weigh as you take on sort of this next phase in your actuarial um, discussion. Now, I don't know, I don't know if I said, you, well, you've been quiet. So either I did good or you've been biting your tongue. He's bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> I well, I just like to say that um, what you have been doing has been very successful 
And I think keeping at the forefront what your goals are, which is rate stability, is very important. And I think each time that we present to you on contribution rates, those are things we can be discussing. Do you need to, for example, if the 100% entry age normal cost, which is your rate floor, if it goes up from what you've currently adopted, do you need to go there or stay where, you're, where you are with your rate? Right? Those are all discussions and decisions that the board gets to make, and we can look at it in, in concert with where is your funded status right now. Our office also produces projections of your funded status and projections of where your contribution rates are going. We can use all of that information when it's time for you to make those decisions on your contribution rates. But what you have been doing is very successful. If, and, and you are in a period where your funded status has been positive over 100%. If it falls below 100%, that underlying aggregate actuarial cost method will take care of that for you. Um, so what you're doing is working, um, and I think the decisions around your funded status should be discussions we have when it comes to contribution rate setting, right? What decision do you want to make on your contribution rates that will match your goal of rate stability, but also consider the projections of where you, what your funded status is, is and, and where we're projecting it to be in the future? Um, I, I would also, since I have the floor, uh, like the opportunity to say if you are considering a change to your actuarial cost method, your underlying method, which right now is aggregate, we would like an opportunity to consult with you on the implications of that because that would then change our work on your valuation. Um, and you, I'd like you to understand what that would mean, especially in a period where maybe that funded status has dropped below 100% and now you're faced with how are we amortizing that unfunded liability. Are there any other agencies that have adopted a, a ratio corridor? No. Yeah. no. And it would be um, using your, cur your current actuarial cost method is an, uh, is an uh, approved method. So um, the corridor is mainly a policy that helps you define uh, kind of so it's not ad hoc. Um, you've got a, something that you can communicate to other stakeholders. Why aren't you doing something about rates? Well, because we're at 103 and our policy is that's our zone of comfort and we don't do anything. Um, what are you doing about rates? Well, we're at 109. Our policy says we will uh, be pursuing, uh, you know, consulting with OSA <coughs> to develop ideas to uh, or recommendations for getting that back towards 100. Those are the kind of uh, that kind of policy, for instance, could be helpful for me during session explaining the board's rate adoption to legislators who might want to change it. If they say, what are you doing to manage your uh, good news? And, and I present them with a policy that's reasonable, then that's one type of discussion. <clears throat> if they say, what are you doing? And I say nothing, then that's a different, it leads to a different kind of discussion. So that having that policy as a guideline both for future boards, for uh, outside parties, whether they're legislators or plan members to understand better what you're doing or not doing and why you are or are not doing that, that would be the goal of the, the corridor type of approach that was laid out, uh, that we discussed in <coughs> October and was laid out in the in the previous, in, in the October meeting and in that slide that I had earlier. So that corridor is something <coughs> that we could bring back to you as, as kind of a policy for adoption in December. We, before we did that talk with OSA um, about how that would or would not be helpful 
but for from the perspective of the plan members and legislative stakeholders, uh, employers, in terms of giving them some understanding of how you are managing what your policies are with respect to managing uh, the funded ratio. This is an example of a type of policy that would be simple, easy to communicate to them they, so that they could understand what you're, what you're doing or not doing and why. The specific thing that you decide to do might be more complicated, but at least the policy then would be uh, simple to understand. Patrick? Um, um, this is the slide we have up right now is, is an example of what you would like to see, correct? It's not in policy yet. This is not in policy yet. No, okay. this would be sort of uh, taking the discussion that you had in October and some of the ad hoc decisions that the board has made over the past 10 years and kind of formalizing that a bit. Yeah, uh, my, my concern would be right now, um, because we don't have anything and we're, we're bordering on 109 if not even more uh, and we we will have groups shooting at us there's no doubt about it if we put this policy out next or this month or next month as is uh, they will be hunting you because we will be over the 110 already and they're going to be they will they'll come into here and try and put pressure on us to decrease contributions how would we fight that? Well, you're not over 110 now, but th you, where you're at right now is in that 105 to 110 zone of concern, which means preparing responses. And so that's what we would be saying is we're working with OSA to prepare responses to manage that, to get it headed back towards 100, because when the next valve report comes out, which won't be before session, but will be shortly after session, I expect that your funded ratio will be over okay. 110. That's just speculation on my part. Okay. And uh, Stephen, I'm not, I'm just trying to prepare for, for uh, December if we decide to do it. And I, I'm hoping I'm asking a question that you already have the answer to, <laughs> uh, because I, I like when you do that. Uh, <laughs> because we are at 109% right now, give or take, uh, the example you give here is that we that uh, what we'd be doing is monitoring the trends and preparing a response. In preparing the slide, have you also prepared some types of responses you would have at this time? Have you yeah. have you actually have? If I walked into your office later on today and asked you, tell me what you've done to prepare for a response to the idea that we're at 100. 109 going higher. Would you have that? As far as concrete proposals, nope. no. No, uh, not, 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 not concrete, yeah. but you have ideas yeah. on what the response would be. Yeah. We've, um, that's, 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 that's good. Yes is a good answer. Yes. And what I would say is, yeah, monit monitoring trends right now, we're at 109 and the trend is positive, which means this would be, if you want to get out in front of it, you could take action. If you don't get out in front of it, you're going to cross over the 110 and be into the zone of action next year. But, and probably what I'd be looking for, too, is that by looking at the market, the volatility in the market right now, to be looking at reducing contributions would be a, uh, would not be wise for us to do that. So that's the type of response I would be looking for at this time because the market's dropped, what, 2,000 points? It's down, you know, or 1,700. Things, things are going to shake out at the end. but. It's the, uh, at, at this time of the day, that's when somebody asks the question and they don't care about historical and they're really not focusing in on the future. So ours would have to do, that, that's, and that's why we hired you is pretty much because you do both for us. You do the historical as well as futuristic that we uh, respond to when we're asked to. So that's, that's what I'm asking you. I, yeah. I, I, I get concerned about a chart that we are right on the precipice of or they could come after us. And, well, and here's the thing. You're right on the precipice, and th this is just Steve talking. You are right on the precipice. <laughs> if you don't take action, then I think you do have a political risk that someone will take action for you. 
if you take action, if you have a plan, and especially if that plan is reasonable, then I think the idea that somebody's going to come in and fix it for you decreases. Thank you. Any other questions? Ade? Yeah, I, I think uh, when we had this uh, conversation, we were thinking that if we don't have a plan, legislators may take action to force us to do something. So what that means is they'll pretty much take away the power that maybe we have now. So there's some benefit in us establishing some ground rules that may keep, hopefully, the legislators at bay, saying, well, this is their plan. They haven't exceeded that yet. So I agree with what you are proposing. I'm just saying that we need to, as part of this, we need to add time frame to act so that, you know, like Pat is saying, the moment we hit 110, somebody is not out here and say, okay, now you need to do something. If we give ourselves time, say, okay, if we stay above 110 within this number of years or whatever, we need to do something so that we're not having a jerk reaction. And by having this in place, hopefully that will also keep the legislators at bay, knowing that we have a plan and we're st still within our time frame. But I think if it ain't broken, you know, we need to be careful not to fix it. Could I just add one thing? Um, I do know that often they will look at the actuarial valuation report and look at the ca contribution rates we've calculated, et cetera. And I, I will note that in our actuarial certification letter, we do comment that your rate adoption is reasonable in our opinion. So if that adds some level of comfort for you, it, it, it is in our report, um, our, uh, our professional opinion. Great. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Steve. We're on item number four, which is the cost of survivor benefit improvements. Looks like it's presented by Ryan. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Harry. Good. By way of introduction on this topic, the board has been uh, last interim and this interim updating exercises that were done by the board with the state actuary's office uh, over 10 years ago to kind of determine what the costs are of certain frequently requested benefit improvements, for lack of a better terminology. Um, at the September board meeting, you got a presentation from Ryan with the costs of doing a survivor benefit prospectively. Free. Yeah. And um, yeah, free survivor benefit prospectively. And the question was asked to bring back the costs of what would that look like retroactively? And so this is the follow-up to that discussion. With that, Ryan, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Steve. Members of the board, for the record, Ryan Frost, board staff. Uh, and as Steve mentioned, this is an update on the cost of a free survivor benefit. Um, so one of the goals of the left two boards strategic plan is to keep the stakeholders informed. And one of the ways of meeting that goal, um, the board has decided to be briefed on the price of certain benefit improvements over the last two interims. Uh, first, by way of background, uh, before I get to the pricing, just a little bit about um, the different options for a survivor benefit. Uh, so when a member applies for retirement, they'll choose one of four benefit options. They'll either choose a single life, which means when the member dies, their benefit stops. Uh, they'll choose either a joint and 100% survivor, which means when the member dies, their survivor will, will receive the same pension amount. That also leads to the greatest reduction, obviously. Uh, the third option is a joint 50% survivor, which means a survivor would receive half of the pension amount, and then the joint and two-thirds, same thing. Uh, the survivor would receive two-thirds of the amount uh, that uh, the member received in their pension. Uh, for this exercise, we're looking at the, the uh, 
uh, if currently, or in September, excuse me, the staff asked OSA to estimate the cost if all currently active Left 2 members were given the option for a free option 2, which is a free joint and 100% at retirement. Uh, the actuary's office estimated that the employee and total employer contributions rates would each increase by approximately 260 basis points. Uh, over a 25-year period, the employer cost uh, would be approximately $1.3 billion, uh, and the fund assessment would take a hit of approximately 8%. And as Steve mentioned uh, at that meeting, some board members expressed a desire to estimate the price of providing a free survivor benefit to current annuitants as well, not just active members. Um, and the actuary's office estimated that extending that benefit improvement to current annuitants would add $235 million to the 25-year total employer cost, which is approximately a 69 basis point increase to the total employer or in total employer rate. Uh, so overall, um, for providing this benefit to annuitants and to currently active members, uh, the actuary's office estimated that uh, the total employee and employer contribution rates would each increase by approximately 330 basis points. Uh, the 25-year cost would be approximately $1.6 billion, and as a result of the increase in liabilities, the fund assets would take a hit of approximately 10%. Uh, here's what that looks like in some charts for a little bit easier reading. Uh, I'll focus on the chart on the right since that is the, uh, the new pricing for this month uh, and what the um, Est estimated contribution rate hit would be on the right. Uh, the rates with the benefit improvement um, for the employee would go up to 11.87. The employer would go up to 7.12, and the state would go up to 4.75. And then that bottom chart shows that 25-year cost of, of 1.576 billion. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. So the good news is we stay inside our corridor, right? <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> You're out of order. You're out of order. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Any questions for uh, Ryan? And one other note: the the methodology methodology and assumptions the actuaries use to price this are in the report as well. If if you're curious. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Yep. All right, item number five, Steve. All right, by way of introduction, this was an issue that um, the board first learned about at your September meeting. Um, there's a unusual set of historical circumstances that create the, uh, created a situation where you had law enforcement officers that were not reported in any pension plan at all during their career. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Jacob to kind of explain the background on this issue. Uh, Chair Larson, board members, uh, for the record, uh, Jacob White, uh, staff to the board, is this not on? There we go. <laughs> um, so as Steve introduced, the issue uh, that I'm going to discuss today is uh, gaps in eligibility in left one PERS and left two may have resulted in some career law enforcement officers and firefighters not receiving a pension. And the gap uh, that I'm going to focus on is the uh, left one minimum medical and health standards and how they could have resulted in a career law enforcement officer or firefighter uh, not uh, receiving a pension at the end of their career. So uh, left one, uh, as I'm sure you're familiar, uh, is for everyone uh, or for law enforcement officers and firefighters hired before October 1st, 1977. Um, there was an exception to uh, membership for uh, minimum medical and health standards. And so what was uh, a little odd or interesting uh, about this was that it didn't prevent someone from being a law enforcement officer or firefighter. It only prevented them from uh, membership in the retirement system. So someone could work and, and not be a member of the pension system. Um, for those who aren't familiar, the minimum medical and health standards, there is a laundry list of standards from um, kind of the things you would expect, like eyesight, uh, hearing, um, height, weight, and various other uh, medical conditions and mental health conditions. Um, and so it was interesting to read about uh, why those existed. I found a, an old uh, AG opinion where they discussed 
uh, that they believed um, that uh, the, those were included as part of the pension system to help lower the cost of the system under the belief that uh, members uh, who did not meet those standards would end up costing the pension system uh, more. So for those members who, uh, or not members, those employees, those officers and firefighters who uh, did not meet those standards and then therefore were not in LEF-1, uh, many of them uh, ended up in, in PERS, in PERS-1. Um, however, there was an exception uh, to PERS. Uh, it was an odd exception. Um, and, and this was, came from an AG opinion uh, and, and was followed by DRS and employers um, for, for a couple decades. And so um, it was uh, that, uh, so if, if the officer or firefighter who did not meet the minimum medical was employed in a city or town with more than two law enforcement officers or firefighters, um, then they were not uh, eligible uh, for PERS 1, for, for PERS. And so when LEF 2 was created, it closed this gap moving forward for not meeting, for being a police officer or firefighter and not meeting the minimum uh, medical and health standards. It left that up to the employer to determine what those standards were and to hire, and if you were hired as a full-time, fully compensated um, firefighter or, or officer, then you were in LEF 2. Um, but like it, but uh, when they created LEF 2, it did not create an option for those people who had been left out of LEF 1 uh, to then uh, become eligible for LEF 2. So the next attempt at fixing that was in 1981, uh, legislature became aware that there were these individuals out there that uh, were law enforcement officers and firefighters and not included in LEF 1 or LEF 2, and so they created a window uh, to allow them to join. Um, however, this is uh, still difficult nowadays for DRS to do uh, when there's a, a window uh, to uh, work with employers to identify uh, everyone who might be eligible for that. Um, so I can only imagine how difficult that might have been in 1981 uh, when there was uh, you know, uh, not as easy to communicate electronically with everyone. Um, so DRS had to rely on employers to identify uh, these people who were eligible and then to make them aware of the window uh, to join LEFT 2. So then another attempt at fixing it, because there were people who um, at the very least claimed they were not aware of the window um, or who maybe chose, uh, you know, elected not to join left two, um, but because they did not meet the minimum uh, medical and because of that, le that um, AG opinion um, about uh, not qualifying because of the employer they worked at, um, the legislature attempted to fix that, uh, to, to close that gap by correcting the, inter the AGO's interpretation and making that retroactive. And what this did is it'll, it um, made those people who had not opted into LEF 2 during the 1981 window were left out of LEF 1 and left out of PERS. They were then PERS eligible, and that was retroactive to the beginning of their employment. So um, once again, DRS had to rely on employers to identify these individuals. Uh, and then once they were identified, they received the employer and the employer received a bill going back uh, for all their contributions that were owed. Um, it appears that interest wasn't charged to these individuals, so at least they weren't charged interest on that. Um, although I'm not, we're not positive about that, um, at least not positive that all of them were not charged. Um, and so then uh, they, had, um, had, uh, work, they had to work with DRS to get on a payment schedule to pay back uh, what they owed. And so that theoretically would have caught up all of these individuals. They all would be at least in some pension system. But what may have occurred for some of them is they received that bill going back a decade plus, were, start, were making payments on that, and then um, could have uh, separated from employment for various reasons, uh, or chose that they were yeah, separated from employment. Uh, and at that point, they typically from DRS, they would have received the option to either withdraw their contributions and forego a pension, or to receive a reduced pension and continue to make uh, continue to make payments on what they owed for the, the contributions um, going back from when they first uh, started employment. Um, so that's uh, confusing to walk through <laughs> all of that. So hopefully you're able to, to follow along. Um, let's see real quick. 
Yeah, so, so that, that is how, if, if, uh, how a career law enforcement officer or firefighter could have ended up without a pension would have been, they ended up in that situation and they, at the end of that career, they withdrew their contributions or um, there could be individuals out there that just were never aware that fell through all of these uh, various cracks and that um, are, are not aware that they uh, were owed a pension. And so that concludes my presentation. Um, any questions I can answer? I do have a question. So in 1994 when they had the PERS eligibility and that was yeah. clarified by the legislature, so if we have members out now, they, that doesn't apply to them or? It does. The tricky thing that Jacob talked about is how do you identify those people? This was before email, before the internet, before newsletters went out. And so for instance, we, we learned about this issue uh, when we were contacted uh, regarding a member he was employed from 94 until 99, and he didn't become aware of the fact that he was supposed to be reported in PERS until 99. His employer didn't tell him uh, because they were going to owe 20 years of past contributions. He became aware of it through, you know, through the grapevine and contacted DRS, and they said, well, yeah, you, turns out you are eligible. And so they started reporting him in PERS at that point in time and billed him, as Jacob said, for whatever is 18 years prior to that, put him on a payment plan. If he had never contacted DRS, he might have retired, uh, stopped working without ever getting a pension. And there may be people out there that do fall into that category. They were never notified by their employer uh, or their employer never notified DRS that they had people that were eligible for that 94 law and, and, um, and they weren't being reported by the employer. That's one possibility. The second possibility, for, for instance, that individual that we talked about, he was b reported in 99. Unfortunately, then he, he was involved in a duty-related car wreck and <laughs> was, uh, had to separate employment before he could finish paying and, back his 18 years of contributions. And so he was advised at that time that his only option was to pull out his contributions. And um, so he ended up with no pension. Um, now in that, in that case, uh, the advice that that was his only option, that, that was incorrect advice. He should have had an option to retire, take a reduced pension, pay off what he, the remainder of what he owed out of that reduced pension. And there's um, nothing in the record that shows he was ever given that option. That's, right now, that's an administrative issue that we're working through with um, DRS. Uh, but the, the underlying issue of how many of those people out there that they never, they never got to DRS, that we don't know. The yeah, and I, I did make some data requests to DRS, and I, well, not surprisingly, they didn't have any data going back to the 1981 window or the 1994 window about how many people joined at that time or how many people might have been eligible at that time. So they really weren't aware of yeah, what potential universe of employees is out there. Was the window for the uh, left to a very short window? It was from the time session ended uh, to the to December thirty first that year, so it was uh, about what, like se six months. Comment? Yeah, Mr. Fosses, I'll let you state your name, who you are. <laughs> James A. Fossis. Turn on the mic. How's that? There you go. James A. Fossis. I'm the uh, vice president of the Washington State uh, Firefighters. Um, also a pension board rep with the uh, Seattle, F Seattle Pension Board. And we had three occasions. Two of them were, um, one of them was the fire chief, uh, and the other was a paramedic that were under the city pension plan because they didn't fall under the um, left 
one require medical requirements. They got a very good attorney and used the information that you were speaking of and our board was directed by DRS to enroll them under LEF-1 and they were paid all their back medical expenses, everything that they would have had under LEF-1. We had another firefighter that was a paramedic and this firefighter had belonged to one of the prior um, employment programs and was not actually a Seattle firefighter, but an ex a Seattle firefighter potential. They had a, a different name for it back then. But this uh, firefighter was also um, by DRS directed to become uh, a left one retiree uh, because of her employment with Seattle. So you're right, it has had results in, and we have three of our members. And I think the, the last one I spoke to, I think this firefighter was a left two firefighter. And I think she had to move from left two to left one. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Any other questions for Jacob or Steve on this issue? We do have it uh, as an item listed as potential possible action. Do you want to touch on that? So if this is if this is an issue that you want us to bring back options for, then that's what we would do in December. We could uh, bring you back some options for potential legislation, for instance, um, for your discussion and possible vote at the December meeting going into session. That would take a motion. All right. Ade? Uh, move the motion that uh, we direct the staff to bring forth some recommendation for our December. There's been a motion. Is there a second? Second. The motion's been made and seconded. Is there a discussion on the motion? Jason, go ahead. <clears throat> Steve, just for the uh, education of the board and people here, can you uh, maybe give a brief ex uh, explanation of what those options might look like? There's... Um, uh, two possibilities that immediately come to mind. One is that if a member was never reported at all, um, they could contact DRS and retroactively be enrolled in membership in PERS pursuant to that 1994 bill. Um, unclear right now whether that could all be done administratively already. We talked through that with uh, DRS before December. Also, that affects the PERS system, which although it, ap it applies to law enforcement officers and firefighters, because it impacts the PERS system, that may be also an issue uh, about wh whether, the, whether you want to propose that or not. The other possibility is to provide some sort of remedy within left two then. So for instance, hard, hard to say what that would look like, but it could involve left two uh, membership and a left two pension of some kind for those people who were never reported. <coughs> uh, that would definitely take legislation, and it, but it would also then definitely be within the board's scope of authority. I know it's a bit of a quagmire uh, but <clears throat> from my personal experiences um, with um, my members at the Clark County Sheriff's Office uh, that f fall, I have two members that fall in these kind of these blurry areas. And um, uh, I was made aware of, you know, this kind of issue talking to them last year. And it sounds like um, it's, uh, it's not uh, overarching. It's not a huge issue, but it seems to be an issue almost everywhere in the state. There's some agency that has like one or two of these people and, and they're somewhat outliers. And it, it seems like it would be beneficial to um, have some type of way to remedy this, not that we need to start a whole you know, management team for this, but to have something uh, to make sure that these people are made whole and that we're doing our job and we're being fiduciarily responsible. Yeah, the, the issue of member of uh, firefighters and law enforcement officers being in the PERS system 
has taken on new meaning since the ex creation of the Left 2 Board. Prior to the Left 2 Board, there were no duty-related disability benefits in Left 2. The pension that you got out of Left 2 and the pension that you got out of uh, PERS were both calculated using uh, two-year final average salary, or a uh, 2% multiplier, I should say. PERS actually had a two-year final average salary and left to had a five year so there may have been members back in 1981 who thought for whatever reason PERS is a better system. Since the uh, existence of the board now you have duty disability benefits that apply to left two that don't apply if you're in PERS and so you might have paramedics or Law enforcement officers working side by side, they could be in the exact same car, in the exact same car wreck, and have entirely different pension benefits as a result. And uh, the other thing that's kind of some of these um, ancillary benefits now, L and I, if you um, paramedics, for instance, or some uppers, law and left members, for lack of a better word, may not uh, get the same presumptions that apply to left members. And bargaining. Um, if you're in PERS, you have different bargaining rights than you do in left, even if you're doing the same job. And that's that interplay between uh, collective bargaining and the pension system has taken on um, new uh, emphasis over the last 10 years, DRS now has had to face a number of different issues that were motivate where employers were trying to keep members out of the left system, not necessarily because of the pension system, but because of the uh, bargaining rights that were associated with them being left members. So yeah, th that issue of police officers and firefighters being reported in the PERS system has a number of different um, twists to it. This issue, though, of police officers and firefighters not being reported in any system at all, that was brand new. Um, that was something that until I became aware of this issue when it was brought to the board's attention in September, I had never heard of, that there were... Uh, the idea that somebody could be a law enforcement officer for over 20 years and have no pension at all, I would have uh, uh, did say when I first learned about it, that's impossible, and found out that actually it wasn't. Um, right now, we're only aware of this one particular member to the extent that now with newsletters, the internet, the um, reaching out, be the ability to reach out to all of the current active members. We may find from their peers who the, some of these other people were that may have slipped through the cracks prior to uh, 1994. On the motion, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, my question or comment may actually be more for tall. Can we really, as part of our options to consider, can we make a decision that will have an impact on PERS? Since that was directed at me, I will attempt to answer. And I think the answer is probably no. Um, however, you can propose in, in legislation that, that might have an interest an impact on PERS. Okay. Um, the other thing that concerns me since I'm um, it's just thinking about this is clearly the intent of the left to enabling legislation was to give a voice to those who risk their lives for the sake of the public, right? And that is all law enforcement officers and firefighters. But what's odd about it is that the legislation is written members of left to plan, which is defined as those who receive benefits. And by definition, these people don't receive benefits. So it's, it's an interesting, it's, it's an even, you know, it's, it's a can of worms, as someone I think said earlier. But having said that, I don't really, given that the intent of the legislation was clearly to look at the broad, broader group, I don't, I, I, I can't see who would object. Let's put it that way. Right. Historically, the board has recommended bills 
that sometimes apply to other plans. And then it's up to the legislature to decide whether that recommendation was appropriate or not. Um, um, sometimes when it's affected other plans, like the troopers, for instance, they'll come in and testify their support for the bill. Here, we haven't, the board hasn't done anything that's affected another plan in quite some time. And so that would be a consideration if you go down the route that the remedy is a PERS remedy. Because I was just thinking that, you know, if we just consider a remedy within left two, I think we have more control and more latitude to be able to take care of this group quickly than, you know, recommending to the legislator to put it on purse, but I'm sure when we next month we'll take a look at all of that. So yeah. Yep. Any other discussion on the motion? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. It is uh, 11.21, lunch is ready. Um, Mr. Nelson, as normal, do you want us to take about uh, 11.45, grab a quick little break, lunch, and then start in with your, uh, your admin update? That works. Okay, so 11.45, so grab some lunch. All right. You can't make the motion. So, so moved. <laughs> there we go. Second. Nice try. We do have a Just motion, checking. and it's been seconded. Yeah, I caught that one. Yeah. Uh, way to go, Steve. Yeah. Discussion. Seeing none. All those in favor of adopting the calendar as presented, say aye. 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 Those opposed. All right. Oh, okay. Motion carries. Yep. All right. So we have adopted. So looking at. Uh, Anything else on that part you need to discuss? So we go to number eight. I think we're on month of death payment. Yes. And this is our kind of a final presentation and brings back Jacob. Yes, by way of introduction, um, historically the board takes final action on your proposals in December so that you can kind of prioritize which issues you wanna work on in session and you could have them all before you in December. Um, this issue was moved to you asked to move this issue to November so that the select committee would have the opportunity to consider your action if they wanted to change what they had done at their December meeting. With that, Jacob is here to tell you what's before you and he'll explain to you what the, the final outcome of the select committee action is um, to date. Okay. Uh, for the record, Jacob White, staff to the board. Uh, the issue here was first brought to the board by uh, Department of Retirement Systems. Uh, in the month a retiree or survivor passes away, DRS prorates the last month benefit payment uh, based on the number of days the person was alive in the month. And frequently this results in an invoice being sent to the family or estate to collect any amount that should have been prorated. And uh, Steve said DRS uh, came to the board with this proposal and also uh, simultaneously to the Select Committee on Pension Policy asking both to endorse uh, legislative action. So just to walk through an example, uh, the current policy, if a retiree dies on day 10 of a 30-day month, that entitles them to receive a prorated benefit of one-third of the month. Um, However, uh, typically DRS is not notified uh, in time, depending on the date in which someone dies and, and where they pass away, whether it's in-state or out-of-state. Um, there can be a delay in receiving notification that someone has passed away, and that results in uh, their estate or family receiving a full month's benefit and DRS needing to re re uh, seek uh, repayment of uh, the benefit. So the reasons this was brought forward is uh, that can obviously be a burden for grieving families it is a, uh, to, to contact them when they're uh, dealing with the death of a loved one and seeking uh, repayment of a benefit. Uh, there are uh, administrative costs uh, to the Department of Retirement Systems to collect the, these repayments. And then also um, the health care authority wrote a letter into the select committee in support of this legislation um, because it also can cause issues for them uh, with insurance premiums and seeking repayment for those. 
So another policy issue that came up uh, at the Select Committee uh, was uh, the Reservation of Rights Clause. And so the Select Committee initially passed out a version of the bill with a Reservation of Rights Clause. And for those who aren't aware of what that might be, uh, a Reservation of Rights Clause uh, when included with the new pension benefit allows that pension benefit to either be repealed or amended at a later date. Um, the Supreme Court affirmed the legislature's authority to do this a few years back in the gain sharing and Eucola cases. And so uh, typically uh, the legislature uh, in the past has included a reservation of rights clause. Well, first they've only used it sparingly, but when they've used it, uh, there's typically been a large uh, cost. Um, in, for example, the Eucola being a great example of that, that it was a, a uniform cola for Plan 1 members uh, for PERS and TERS uh, Plan 1 members uh, automatic going forward. Um, and so that had about a, what was it, like $855 million uh, cost to the state. Um, and so they included a reservation of rights clause in there in case they did not uh, have the funding in the future to continue to uh, provide that benefit. And then um, another reason would be, uh, an example would be gain sharing, where there's an uncertain cost moving forward um, where, uh, yeah, you're not sure what you're going to uh, require future uh, um, taxpayers to pay uh, for this benefit, and it gives that ability to change that in the future if needed. And uh, another example would be if um, you want to be able to change a policy moving forward, so it's not so concerned with the potential cost of it, but there's reason to believe, believe that you may want to make changes to that policy moving forward, including a reservation of rights clause uh, makes that simpler to do. And so with the, want to just quickly touch on the left two board and when, uh, when reservation of rights clause have been used. And there's only two examples of it being used. Uh, one was a 2010 benefit for catastrophic disability medical insurance premiums uh, reimbursement, um, which was really a, a bridge to Medicare. And so the concern there was is there could be changes to Medicare, which the left two board obviously has no control of, and that could impact the cost to the system. And so the left two board wanted to be able to um, relook at that if there were changes to Medicare. And then the other one was in 2006, the survivor health care insurance, and this provided uh, access to PEB for cer certain survivors. And um, there was uh, some concern raised at a left two board meeting by a member about um, potentially wanting something other than PEB in the future, that maybe PEB wouldn't be the benefit that uh, retirees and survivors would, would want. And so this uh, kept that, uh, made that easier for them to change in the future. And so I should say, uh, go back here, but uh, so uh, just an update on what happened to the select committee. Uh, so at the, so I said initially the select committee passed out a version of the bill with a reservation of rights clause. Um, they ended up going back and uh, changing that. And so they uh, voted to reconsider the bill. And then at the meeting earlier this month, they passed out a new version of the bill without a reservation of rights clause. Um, And so OSA's fiscal note on this proposal, uh, highlighted there in yellow, is the cost to uh, left two. Uh, it's a three basis point impact to employees, two to employer, and one to the state. And then total budget impact, and this is for all systems and plans, uh, not just left two. That there. Then having your materials uh, just the impact uh, for left. And so the options uh, before you today are, have option one with an A and a B. Uh, so that is to, uh, for, to, to pay a full month of death payment. And option A is do not include a reservation of rights clause. And B is to include the reservation of rights clause. And then option two would be to continue with the current practice. That is my presentation. If you have any questions. Jeff, go ahead. <clears throat> Sorry. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the number of five basis points to left two, uh, I understand that we'd be, whether it's reservation rights or not, we'd be uh, absorbing that. Uh, it's interesting because it, I bet if I went back and I talked about the general fund impact on this, if I went back and figured out the total cost of actually having to go back 
and recover these things that the DRS is incurring as a budgetary impact on this that's more than offset when you talk about total, bud total budget impact uh, farther than that five basis points we're talking about there with the amount of effort and personnel they'd have to assign to do something like this. Th this makes, and this is something that, that is one of those things, again, that you don't often say, but uh, this is something that, that is so morally compelling to do that it's almost budget be damned on this, you know, is, you'd actually want to go back and, and, and add this kind of an impact to somebody else that's in the middle of a grieving process and everything else that comes at them with this. This is sort of a no-brainer uh, without a reservation clause uh, on this. Uh, just I'm, I'm absolutely for it, and, and, and I think it's just a matter of budget shifting. It's not budget impact at this point. So before us, when we... Is that a motion? So before us, we have option 1A. Further discussion? Nelson, do you have any insight or? Yeah, well, 1A matches what the select committee did. Yeah. So if that uh, passes, then the result would be a bill that would be jointly recommended by the select committee and the left two board. Would it be our bill? <coughs> uh, it's their bill. The language is identical. Okay. So it would be one bill. The green sheet just has two agencies sign on it. Okay. Perfect. Discussion? Yeah. Jeff? Uh, again, one of those things that uh, I would expect you'd probably have a champion in both chambers so you'd run a companion bill on something like this so it'd come through rather quickly. Yeah, his historically when there's been coordinated bills, the select committee legislators sort of take the lead on sponsoring and they do arrange uh, House and Senate companions bipartisan if at all possible and we make sure our legislators on the left two board have a chance to uh, sponsor as well we'll leave a space yeah. <laughs> all right all right so seeing no other discussion then the motion before us is to uh, move forward with uh, bill and support of option 1a all those in favor say aye Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Hey. Anything else for Jacob? Are you good? All right. Thank, thanks. You. Thank you very much. Item number nine, agenda items for future meetings. Mr. Nelson. Currently, the December meeting has got a few things planned, and so it'll be important to have a quorum there. Um, you will be getting your annual um, update from the SIB. Usually that happens earlier in the year, but working around calendars this year, Teresa's available in December. Um, you will also, as uh, discussed briefly earlier, be getting a preview from the State Actuary's Office on the next demographic experience study, uh, looking back at the last five years. The question came up earlier this interim about the adoption of administrative factors. That was originally on the schedule for November at the request of DRS, and then it was moved to December because there's um, um, DRS is analyzing the new the uh, newly um, what's the word suggested recommended factors uh, for the administrative impacts it, that is on the agenda for December but it may get bumped until next interim again at the request of DRS they adopt the admin factors for all the other plans and so we want to make sure the coordination is um, that the adoption is coordinated so that all the factors are being um, going into place and being communicated by DRS to the plan members all at the same time. So that, that may or may not be on the agenda. One of the other uh, DRS request items was uh, had to do with when spouses are required to notarize retirement applications. The final proposal on that issue is scheduled for December. Um, the next step in the 
pricing of frequently requested benefit improvements has to do with the final average salary and we'll have the uh, pricing on what it would take what the cost of changing that would be that'll be on for December there was a um, issue that the board's been talking about all year as well uh, allowing and members who picked a survivor option to change that option after they retire and under circumstances that's scheduled for final action in December there'll be an educational briefing on the benefit improvement account um, that was requested going into session and then following the discussions earlier this interim we'll also be bringing to you a proposed uh, budget for the re agency operating budget for the remainder of this biennium for your approval uh, historically that's been something that the I've been in I've done the budget and you guys have reviewed it and uh, and questioned it as as you've had questions but now we'll be implementing that policy change moving forward where we'll actually be bringing the budget to you for your adoption and that'll take place sort of for the re the remaining six months or so of the biennium that'll happen in uh, December following up on today then the issue of the membership gap for some uh, of the left one members who failed to meet the minimum medical standards and were never enrolled in left or in PERS uh, we'll have a final proposal on that for you as well in December potentially a funding policy to look at yeah we'll have I'll talk with OSA about that I think the <coughs> like for instance the adoption of the corridor will bring back to you for further discussion and potential adoption as well mr. chair yes sir uh, I think uh, earlier we talked about the uh, administrative policy regarding either attendance or something like that. I thought we were going to discuss that in, we're in December. At, uh, that is correct. We, we talked about you know, whether or not we wanted to see a draft policy that would outline, you know, uh, our attendance of board members, participation, education. Yes. Yeah, I think you're right. I didn't have that on the list, but I'm. Uh, on this list but I'm pretty sure we've already been moving forward on having that ready for December as well okay. so that's a good reminder okay gotcha. that will also help us uh, a day as you mentioned before is uh, with the the educational opportunities for training if we have a policy and have expectations that provides further I don't want to say coverage but it provides a, I, I think m maybe a further explanation of why it's important and what we're doing so Anything else, Steve, Tor? Anything else from the group? Ade? With uh, the State Auditor's Office presentation, I'm just curious, because I deal with this every year, so I'm curious, how much do we usually pay for the audit before we sign up with the um, SAO? When we were doing, prior to this year, we'd been using Davis Accounting. Um, and their prices originally were similar, but over 10, 15 years. The last time Davis did the accounting, uh, did the audit, it was a little bit more expensive than what um, the SAO did. We did go out and get a number of bids from other um, CPA firms that do these types of audits. And the auditor's office was the lowest cost Partly, they're familiar with dealing with um, governments. Yes. And they also, uh, we had to work around the timing just a little bit because uh, right after the close of the fiscal year is a crazy busy time for them. But by being willing to wait until November instead of normally having the presentation in September, it allowed uh, them to do it at a time that worked well for their workload management. And this was their first one, so they can actually lower the cost next year. It, um, it was uh, 
by all our accounts internally, it was a very cooperative um, agreement. Uh, working with Steve Davis over the years had been awesome. He was uh, he had great working relationships with the staff, very professional, very well respected. But I'm getting to that point in my career where the people that I've been working with for years and years are all retiring, <laughs> and that that was the case with. Uh, Steve Davis as well. He he retired. We wish him well. He actually did our last audit even technically after he retired because he still liked doing it so much. It was sort of a, you know, a working after retirement, fifth stool of the retirement thing. But, um, but no, he was done for sure this year. And uh, so we were looking for who do we replace doing that. And now that they're familiar with our procedures, uh, they think they'll be able to do it as they mentioned to you today. So we'll certainly um, look out and see who else is out there next year as far as uh, potential auditors. But I don't, my, if the experience next year is anything like this year, um, we're not going to find anybody less expensive than them. I, I did have some other peers that kind of gave me the you're intentionally hiring the state auditor to come in. Uh, but actually, it's a credit to you. One, because of the work that Davis had been doing, and the, I know how professional our internal staff is, I wasn't concerned that there were any internal controls or internal policies that were um, going to be found out of line by the state auditor. And I thought also one of the goals from the board going back to the very beginning is that external credibility. And so having your financial uh, statements audited by the state auditor's office provides that kind of transparency and credibility that has been your goal from year one. Mm -hmm. so. I, I think uh, with the state auditor's office, I think uh, you have access to so many staff if you need to and I think uh, they will be able to rotate the staff if they need be at the same time maintaining the quality. I've been working with them for the past 28 years I think actually uh, since uh, Pat took over I think you can also see the attitude you know I think uh, they're more customer oriented now at the same token retaining their independence uh, and I think uh, they are really willing to listen because I think I did meet with uh, uh, representing some of our city members uh, several years ago when some of our members actually had uh, issues with the state auditor's office. Now they are very, very responsive, again, without losing their independence. And based on the quote that they just gave, I think uh, with their familiarity with the, your report, they save time, and when they save time, they save us money. Yes. And I think that is a good thing. <coughs> so, thank you. Anything else before the group? <clears throat> All right. Uh, we will see everyone December 19th. Yes, that's the next meeting. Board meeting, yep. And then admin meeting, 830? Yes. Okay. All and right. photo op immediately following adjournment. Stuck around. I don't get, I don't get there. Okay. <laughs> we, are, we are adjourned. Motion to adjourn. Move. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed. Well, we are adjourned. <laughs>